I had never been to Lake Superior before. But as you just saw this week, I went up with my good friend, John Ross, who's pastor of the Wyzetta Community Church. We went up to the south side of Lake Superior to stay at a pretty remote cabin out on a little peninsula. And when we drove up to the cabin, there was this mama bear with three cubs sitting right at the edge of the forest, about 30 yards off the front door of the cabin. And it was thrilling at first to see this mama bear playing with the cubs, and they're just so beautiful. But after a couple hours, the bear and the cubs, they were staying right there. And so we started to yell at them, not in a mean way, just yelling, hey, mama bear, head on out, mama bear. We just started yelling. They didn't budge. And then another bear came along and kind of checked out our car. And then another bear started walking across the back of the cabin. I began to realize they live there. We had sort of just occupied their territory. If you're counting, there were six bear living right there. And it was beautiful, and black bears aren't aggressive, but that's a lot of bear. And, and so we decided the better part of valor would be just to stay in the cabin for those two days. We had planned on taking lots of walks. John and I meet a few times a year to be friends and and to work on, on ministry together. But we just decided we're staying in the cabin those two days. We would sit um, in the back porch looking out. It was right on Lake Superior. It was a great time. My rear end was real sore from sitting. But, you know, being the first time at Lake Superior, I did what I bet every single first-time visitor to Lake Superior does. You sit there and you start to sing... Gordon Lightfoot's The Edmund Fitzgerald. You know that hit in the 1970s about the shipwreck that happened there? I, I, I did what everyone does. For hours, I would say, the legend lives on, <laughs> the legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of a big lake they called Gitchigumi. <laughs> the lake, it is said, never gives up its dead. I would sing this song all the time. When the skies of November turn gloomy. After singing that song about a hundred times, I'm not sure if it's a great song or a really horrible song. There's like no way to tell. Lake Superior is an awesome lake. It's the largest freshwater lake in the world by surface area. And it's 1,300 deep at points. Do you know if you combined all of the Great Lakes, Lake Superior has more water than all of them combined. It's an awesome lake. Has there been a lake that's been important in your life? If you ask people that, many of us have a lake that played a role in our lives, in, in shaping us. There was a lake at the church camp I went to every year, really a big pond, but to a child, it was a lake. And being around that lake at church camp through the years, it shaped me. Oh, do you know, it had one of those floating docks with a high dive for the campers. And I remember like it was yesterday, being about 11 years old, and the high dive was like 10 feet but it seemed epic to me. And I'd never jumped off one before. And I remember standing on the board and I looked over to the shore and there was the 11 year old girl that I had a crush on. And when you're an 11 year old boy and you just feel this, this rush of, you can do anything in, in front of a girl you have a crush on. And I remember jumping off that board, taking the great leap. I felt so proud and adventurous. Lakes create adventures and they're also calming. I, we would take canoes on that lake, you know, two of us. So you'd let two kids, and they could always have us within sight, but two kids alone in a canoe, it felt like an adventure, like being 
Huckleberry Finn on the Mississippi lakes. Do you have a lake that's been important in your life? Every year we would vacation as a family in Door County, Wisconsin, a peninsula out on Lake Michigan. I continued even as an adult. And I remember in 2003 sitting on the deck of my dad's cabin. I would meet my dad there for at least a, a week every year. We're sitting on the porch of that cabin right over the lake. And kind of out of nowhere, my dad says, you should consider looking into First Plymouth Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Well, I, then I was a pastor of a church in San Francisco. I'd never been to Nebraska. It was sort of sideways, but my dad had just given a book talk um, at First Plymouth, and he thought it was a wonderful church. He said, you should look into that, Jim. And I said, Nebraska? Are there bear there? <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, it came out of nowhere, but now it's become such a part of my life, First Plymouth. We're remembering our fathers today. The amazing thing about a dad is, you know, they want you to find your way, and they have this way of prompting. My dad was never pushy, um, but he, he wanted me to find my way so badly. You know, when you have parents behind you that want you to find your way, it's like having a team. We all know how, what a hardship that is if you haven't had that team behind you in life. We're celebrating good dads today. You know, Jesus hung out on a lake, and he had a good dad. I'm sort of half kidding if you think of his dad as God Almighty. But I mean, he had a real dad, Joseph. And they hung out on the lake. Jesus, his teachings, his miracles, his ministry around the Lake of Galilee. It was called the Lake of Genesaret in the reading, same lake. And his father, we don't read his earthly father, Joseph. We don't read that much about him in the Gospels, but it's clear he was support for Jesus, like good dads are. In, in Luke, as a 12-year-old, when they took Jesus to Jerusalem, you could see the kind of care of his mother and father. And Joseph, how he protected the family, leading them down into Egypt, away from an evil king. Uh, Joseph was a good dad. Oh, hey, Tom, can you put a camera on a symbol in our, uh, in our windows here at First Plymouth? I, I, are you there? Good. Um, this symbol is really intriguing. It's called the Carpenter's Cross, and it's two saws crossed because this is honoring that, that Joseph was a carpenter, and that's why we believe Jesus was a carpenter, that he followed into his father's work. That symbol is interspersed throughout our windows. Jesus is at the Lake of Galilee. He was so often by the lake. And the crowd is pressing in on him. So he gets in a boat to sort of socially distance a little bit. And he sits in the boat and he teaches them. So often the Gospels just say this. He taught them without giving the content. I mean, we have his Sermon on the Mount. We have all his parables and other sayings. But often they don't tell us. And so I'm always intrigued what else Jesus was teaching? The Gospels don't have everything that he taught. Here he's sitting in the boat teaching them. And then at one point, he says to Peter, put out into the deep. I think right there is the statement that is the essence of our religion. Put out into the deep. This is what Jesus wants each one of us to do. This is what religion should be. He wants us to seek depth, put out into the deep. Religion, if it is anything, is supposed to take us into the depth of life, to see and understand things more deeply, put out into deep water. So often we stay in the shallows. We can be very superficial, living on the surface, Religion, if anything, is trying to prompt you to live deeper. There's lots of ways we can be shallow. We often have a shallow estimation of each other. When you know a person, you start to think 
you really know that person, and you put them in categories of your own understanding. But a person is an infinite depth. A person is an inexhaustible depth you could forever explore and learn more about, but we just start categorizing people. That's a shallow approach to others. We even do it with ourselves. We are a depth, but are we really exploring our own depths? Do you know one of the sad things that can happen in a long-term marriage is they the way they take each other for granted. They start to think they fully know each other. They become less curious about each other. Each one of us is an infinite depth. And so Jesus says, put out into the deep. What are you doing right now to explore your depths? Put out into the deep. Do you have some practices? Do you have a way you're always seeking out to learn more about yourself? Don't think you know yourself perfectly. You don't. It's a life task to discover more and more of who you are. The most important temple in the ancient Greek world was the Temple of Apollos, uh, of Apollo. The Temple of Apollo at Delphi, and it had an oracle where people would seek this temple to learn about themselves, what their lives were to be. Now, there's an inscription in the temple at Delphi that said simply, know thyself. And this became a great uh, adage in the Greek thought world. Aristotle and Plato picked up on it. This is the great philosophical task, to know thyself. Actually, at that temple, there were three inscriptions. It said, know thyself. Then it said, nothing in excess and surety brings ruin. You could spend a lifetime exploring those three inscriptions. Nothing in excess. We're all about excess. Taking things in moderation is hard for us. Living moderately. Nothing in excess and surety brings ruin. We're all about opinions these days and holding fast and being sure of our opinions. Surety brings ruin. Great inscriptions, but know thyself. Ben Franklin said there are three hard things in life. Well, the three hardest things are steel, diamonds, and knowing thyself. Ralph Waldo Emerson believed that the journey of knowing thyself is the key spiritual journey because he believed the divine was within. And so the deeper you can go within, you can discover God. Now, I know I have to go pretty deep. I don't feel very divine in most of my actions and my thoughts. But if you went deeply enough within, you can discover the divine. Know thyself. Put out to the deep. This, this call from Jesus to each one of us. Oh, it's the call of how we should approach Scripture. So often Christians uh, uh, read Scripture on the surface. In fact, there are types of Christians that take pride in just looking at the plain meaning of Scripture. But Jesus says, go deep, plumb deeply into Scripture, beyond just the literal words, into symbolic and spiritual and metaphorical, allegorical understandings. Get spiritual, get deep. The same with our religion itself, Christianity. Go deep. Paul Tillich was one of the great theologians of the church. He was a German theologian in the 1930s. And when Hitler became chancellor, you know the brain drain that began to happen. Tillich had spoken out against Hitler. He had to flee. He moved to the United States, became one of the great theologians of history. He believed that the key aspect of religion is depth. That, that this is how he held the difference between the sacred and the profane or the mundane. The sacred is about depth, the dimension of depth that it can carry. Now, let me explain. This gets a little abstract, but, but Paul Tillich thought that if Christians believe, as he did, in an infinite God, then you can't imagine God 
as a being alongside other beings, like an old man with a beard. God can't be a being alongside other beings. That would make God finite. God can't be an object in the universe. God is infinite. So God is not a being, according to Tillich. God is being itself. And so he thought that God is the ground of all being. And this is what religion is trying to hearken to. This religious impulse in us, this faith impulse, it's not about discovering another reality within reality. God is not another reality within reality. No, God is at the essence, the ground of being of all things. He thought that Christianity, when it loses a dimension of depth. It just looks at the superficial, literal meanings of its symbols and scriptures. But they're trying to point to this inexhaustible depth at, at the center of all things. He felt that when we began to take the symbols literally, we lose our depth. Put out into deep water. Christianity is trying to take you deeper. You know the Buddha? The Buddha would tell a story all the time, different versions of it, but he was frustrated that people would revere him. Instead of using his teachings to discover their depths, their own depths, they would put him up on a pedestal and revere him. And so he would tell a story about a canoe. He said, when you take a canoe to get across a river and then go on a long journey, you don't continue to carry the canoe out of a way to honor it, to thank it for getting you across the river. You don't continue to lug it around. You leave it behind. He wanted them to leave him behind, use his teachings to journey forward. Well, it's the exact same with Christianity. We don't worship Christianity. Our job is not to honor and revere Christianity. We worship God. And Christianity is a vehicle to take you on that journey or into the depths. It's like a boat. It takes you to the depths. We don't worship religion. We worship God and seek the deep and the true and the right. And so, my friends, today, put out into the deep and don't feed the bears. Amen.